Welcome to Exploring Computing. Today's video is Computer Security Malware. So we're going to continue our discussion on computer security, and today's videos are going to focus on ways that you can be attacked and things that can be done to you. And um, the next lecture will focus on ways you can protect yourself. So I want to start off by talking about malware. Malware is uh, basically the term comes from malicious software. And this is software that can get installed on your computer and do some nasty stuff. Uh, specifically, we're going to talk about spyware, ransomware, adware, how your computer can be turned into a zombie computer and placed in a botnet. And then I'll also discuss uh, logic bombs. All right, so let's start off with spyware. Spyware is software that has been installed on your computer that uh, is designed to spy on you. Um, so we saw this with the Dalai Lama example from the previous lecture where uh, the computers in its office were infected by something called Ghost Rat for remote access tool um, and connected to the ghost net. I think the spyware is particularly problematic on modern computer and mobile devices because of the specific capabilities of our computers or mobile devices. It's always been very problematic, but I think it, now more than ever, it's really a problem. Okay, so what sort of things can spyware be used for? Well, the first thing is it can be used to key log. And so what this means is it's going to track all of your keystrokes. So if you go to your bank, for example, it's going to uh, keep track of your username as you type it in, and then it will keep track of your password as you type that in as well. And uh, this information will all be sent over through the network to uh, the attacking person. Um, spyware can also copy files. So for example, if you've got information about financial information on your computer, you can go ahead and take those files and send them somewhere remotely. Um, now, one of the things that it can do on a modern computer or a modern um, mobile device that they didn't used to be able to do is we all have microphones and cameras. And so uh, it can be used to turn on the microphone and listen to what you're uh, saying in a room. Uh, it can turn on the camera. Also, because modern mobile devices keep track of your movements, uh, spyware can be used to track you. All right, ransomware. When it gets on your computer, what it does is it encrypts your entire solid state drive or your entire hard drive, and it asks for payment to decrypt your uh, information. So basically it locks your information and it requires payment typically in Bitcoin in order to unlock uh, your device. Um, so an example of ransomware is the WannaCry. Uh, so this is a ransomware which uh, was released in 2017 and it infected over 200,000 computers in over 150 countries. Uh, it demanded Bitcoin payments from $300 to $600 depending on how soon you paid it off. And uh, it took down large parts of the British National Health Service. Um, it caused so much disruption to the British National Health Service that uh, the British Health Service was forced to turn away patients except for in critical situations. Um, this particular piece of software used an exploit that was known about in Microsoft uh, Windows. And so people that had updated their copy of Microsoft Windows were protected and people that didn't were vulnerable to this attack. Uh, it's believed to have been of North Korean origin, although uh, not known for sure. Adware. Um, there's actually multiple uses of the term adware. Um, some people use it to just refer to any program that displays ads. So for example, so I have Merriam-Webster app on my mobile devices. And when you run it, uh, you can look up words for free. It will read the words to you for free, which I think is a glorious feature, particularly uh, for people learning foreign languages, having dictionaries which can speak words to you is amazing. And I will say I do find it useful in English as well. Um, and you can use the Merriam-Webster app for free because it displays advertisements. Similarly, I have uh, the Weather Channel app on my mobile device. And again, uh, you don't have to pay for it. It displays little ads at the bottom of the app. So some people do consider these adware. I don't, but you can certainly see where the term comes from. Um, I'm going to use the term adware to refer to software that is 
uh, maliciously installed on your computer or surreptitiously installed on your computer that displays ads. You do not know where the advertisements are coming from. And so when you're running your computer, you will see random ads. Sometimes this will be random ads showing up on the web browser when you're browsing the web and they have nothing to do with the website that you're visiting. The website that you're visiting is not getting money from the ads that the AdWords is displaying. And sometimes these can just display ads whether or not you're on the, uh, whether or not you're on the web. So, um, you know, this is clearly an altogether different level than ad supported applications like the dictionary and weather apps I talked about earlier, where it's very clear, you're only going to see ads when you're running that particular application. And those ads are being used to pay for the free service that you're receiving. That's not the case with Adware. Adware is installed typically without your permission. Sometimes it's installed, uh, we'll talk about this a little bit later, but it's installed with your permission because there's a big lengthy terms of agreement that you just click through and say, yeah, 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 okay, this all looks fine. And it turns out one of the terms is we're going to install something nasty on your computer. So, um, that's uh that's adware um and i do generally i use the term only to represent the malicious version of this software although again some people do refer to adware as uh as anything that displays advertisements or pays for itself using advertisements okay uh, another ad related issue that's come up pretty recently is um as you know, when your computer visits different websites, the computer can run software associated with that website. And particularly if they're running client-side JavaScript, it turns out that some websites are now uh, mining for cryptocurrency when you're visiting your their website. So this is, uh, well, it's unclear what the morality or legality of this is. I suppose it's probably legal. It's unclear what the morality of this is. Um, I mean, you are visiting their website. As long as it only runs when they're visiting your website and stops as soon as you leave, I suppose one can make a, a reasonable case that this is this is not illegal or immoral. But um, there have been reports of uh, websites that do this sort of thing, uh, having some sorts of issues where uh, it gets served up by an ad network um, or it locks up your computer. So anyway, potentially problematic is something to be aware of, a yet another threat. Okay, zombie computers. This is another thing that can be done when uh, malicious software gets installed on your computer. Basically, what happens with the zombie computer is malware is installed on your computer that gives a remote user complete control over your computer. Um, the control computers are referred to as zombie computers or bots. And zombie computers or bots are typically put into groups uh, because these are most useful in a group of computers, not a single zombie computer. Um, and the group of computers combined together is what we refer to as a bot network. I did want to mention that there are several different uses of the term bot, and most of the uses are not malicious. So if you hear the term bot, don't immediately think that that's necessarily a bad thing. So. Um, some of the uses of the term bot are uh, independent program that's out crawling the internet. So an example of this would be the Google bot, um, which is a program that Google uses to uh, request it, uh, different web pages. And it's what it uses to form the index information that Google gives you. Um, the term bot can also be used to just refer to any uh, program that's independently acting on someone's behalf. Um, it's sort of comes from the term robot. Um, anyway, I just wanted to mention that. So again, uh, even though bot in this particular case, in, in the use particularly with bot networks is a bad thing. Um, if you do hear somebody referring to computers and, and use the term bot, that's not necessarily a, a negative term by itself. So what are bot networks used for? Well, one common use of bot networks is to send spam. So we've all got unwanted emails. Um, Sometimes they're scam emails. And so one question may be like, why is this allowed? Why can't I just block the spam emails? Um, and so one of the issues with spam emails is if all the spam emails come from the same computer or the same couple computers, then we can just all block them. So one thing that these bot networks are used is to send spam emails from many, many different computers from all over the world, uh, which makes them much harder to block. 
another use is distributed denial of service attacks. So uh, a denial of service attack is when you uh, attempt to deliberately overwhelm a computer by making many, many requests on it. So I always use the example um, of suppose Stanford students want to bring down the Cal computers during big game. Don't do this, by the way. This is a violation of Stanford's uh, terms of service for your use of Stanford computers so, and the Stanford network, so don't do this. But suppose we all decided we were going to, um, on a lark, bring down the Cal computers during big game week. Uh, what we could do is everybody on Stanford campus could just repeatedly hit the Cal computers. And um, at some point, the Cal computers load would be exceeded and legitimate users trying to access the Cal web computers would not be able to access it. All right. So what happens here? Well, Cal kind of looks at uh, they, they're like, we seem to be getting a ton of requests. Our, our computers are getting overwhelmed. What's going on? Oh, look, all the requests are coming from Stanford University. And as you all know now, because you've been taking my class, uh, all the Stanford computers have the same uh, or very similar IP numbers. So the first couple digits in the IP number are the same. And so Caltech support says, well, screw that. We're just blocking any request to Cal coming from a Stanford IP number. So that's a standard denial of service attack. And um, obviously they're annoying and uh, a lot of work for tech people to deal with, but they can be blocked because they are coming from a specific computer, a specific range of computers. So what a distributed denial of service attack does is it says, well, okay, we don't want to have our request denied because they're coming from a specific IP range. What we're going to do is we've got this bot network composed of zombie computers all around the world, and we will instruct all the bots and our bot network to hit the Cal computers. Um, and by the way, now we're getting into very illegal territory, so don't do this. Um, and so at that point, Cal can't really do anything about it because they see many, many different IP numbers and there's no specific range of uh, computers that they can go ahead and ban. So, um, all right, so that's a distributed denial of service attack. And in order to do a distributed denial of service attack, you do need something like a bot network with many computers which are geographically dispersed. Okay, another use of bot networks is click fraud. So there's two variants of click fraud. Um, so in one variant of click fraud, you have a website that is displaying advertisements and you want to increase the, uh, the ad revenue. And so what you do is you have uh, basically fake advertising clicking where, um, you know, normally you're going to get paid for the advertisements you display on your website, particularly on the basis of the number of people that actually click on that ad and look at the website that that advertisement is uh, advertising. And so what you can do is you can uh, use a bot network to have different computers from around the world visit your website and click on the ads on your website and that will increase your ad revenue. Um, again, also highly illegal. Uh, alternatively, what you can do is you can say, hey, my competitor has this big ad campaign going on. What we're going to do is we are going to deliberately visit websites that are displaying our competitors' advertisements and our bots are going to click on those ads. No human beings are involved. So, uh, you know, nobody's actually going to see those advertisements or click through and look at their actual website or the products that they're selling, but it will look like they are. And so basically our competitors' ad money is all going to go to paying off the ad network for ads that only our bots are actually clicking on and no real people are actually seeing. So that's click fraud. Um, just to provide an example of an actual bot network, uh, the Brito Lab worm slash virus, uh, we'll talk about worms and viruses momentarily, uh, infected over 30 million computers and it was infecting at a rate of about 3 million computers per month. Um, what did this thing do? Well, it stole financial information. Um, remember we talked about spyware copying files earlier. Um, it sent out billions of emails, uh, including uh, emails which were infected with itself to try and further uh, expand uh, the Brito network here. Um, it included a keylogger to keep track of uh, whatever people typed to get access to their passwords and, and other information. Uh, but also it, it 
took all those computers that it had infected and created a bot network, which could be rented by third parties for $139,000 a month. Um, there is a link to the article. Thank you, Maddie. That's enough. There is a link to the article discussing this network in today's um, class notes. Okay, uh, here's another thing that can be placed in a program. This one's a little bit different because um, this isn't malicious software that's been installed on your computer. This is actually a program that includes something malicious in the program, which often was added there by the original programmer. Um, so this is called a logic bomb. Um, and essentially a logic bomb is something in a piece of software which triggers under specific circumstances. So um, you've probably seen examples of logic bombs in movies. So, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on in movies that seems to be complete bunk, but uh, a logic bomb is actually doable. So uh, a logic bomb occurs when, for example, somebody reads a specific file, uh, you can trigger some action based on, hey, this file got read, or uh, when tr somebody tries to modify a file. And so the idea is, this is something added to the program or to the operating system that uh, is not part of its intended use that a programmer has placed into this program, where if a specific action occurs, it's going to go off and do something. That something may just be sending an email because sometimes just knowing that somebody is reading a file could be useful information, or it could be something much more malicious. Um, I saw an example on Wikipedia that I rather liked that uh, a programmer who was fired could set up a logic bomb where if they were removed from payroll or somehow payroll marked them as fired, it could do something malicious, like, for example, delete files or something like that. So. You know, I think that's a good example of a logic bomb. <laughs> but again, you know, I think this is one of the few examples where stuff happens in movies and you're like, yeah, okay, that that that's actually related to an actual technique that uh, that can be done. Okay, so uh, how does this malware get on your computer? There's a number of different causes of malware. And so we're going to talk about a bunch of these. We're going to talk about viruses, worms, and Trojan horses. Also, I've mentioned zero-day exploits before, but we'll take a closer look at that. Um, and I should mention that there's overlap between these. So, you know, we actually saw this a minute ago with uh, Brio Lab. Well, there's a virus or a worm. Well, actually, it was both. So um, there are pieces of software that can cover more than one of these. In fact, there are pieces of software that can cover all three of these virus, worms, and Trojan horses. I suppose all four, because it might be based on a day zero zero-day exploit. Okay, so what is a virus? A virus is a computer program which attaches itself to other programs. And so the idea here is um, you've got a bunch of programs on your computer. And so what the virus is going to do is when it runs, it will look for other executable programs on your computer and um, it will add to the instructions in that program copies of itself. So the next time you run that other program, the virus code will run. Um, there's different ways that the virus figures out which programs to attach itself to. Sometimes it's designed to attach specific programs. Sometimes it looks for uh, programs that are running and tries to attach itself to them. But the basic idea here is the virus replicates itself by attaching itself to different programs. Potentially, anything that can be executed can be infected. And this often includes files that you don't normally think of as executable. So zip files, for example, there's versions of zip files which include executable code, which will run when somebody tries to open up the zip file. Um, this is actually why Stanford's computers, uh, Stanford's email computers no longer uh, allow you to send zip files. You kind of get that warning and they're like, no, we don't want people to be send or receive zip files because they are potentially infected. Um, Microsoft Office documents uh, can include scripting information. And so because script is essentially a program, um, they can include viruses. So viruses can add themselves to Microsoft documents. Um, and actually you may notice now, uh, this, this, this got added relatively recently, I think maybe in the last five years, where 
um, when you get a copy of a Word document or, or maybe an Excel document from somebody, um, it will start off and you won't be able to edit it. And it'll be like, are you sure you want to move into edit mode? Um, and so this is, again, to protect against this sort of situations. It's basically running, it's allowing you to view the contents of that document in sort of a more protected mode um, in case there's something malicious within that document. And then it's only when you're like, yeah, I, I'm sure I know who sent this to me. Um, this was extracted and I'm pretty sure that they practice safe computing, hopefully. Uh, so yeah, let's go ahead and open this so I can go ahead and edit it. And so that's what's going on there. It's trying to protect you from uh, viruses attached to the document. Okay, a worm is a program that propagates copies of itself on a network. And so we saw an example of this last lecture when I talked about I Love You, which was a uh, program that um, well, it was actually a combination of several things. It was it was an email that you received that said, I love you. And then uh, there was an attachment on it. And if you open up the attachment, it was actually a Visual Basic script, which ran on Microsoft Outlook, um, which is their email program, looking at all of the addresses in your Outlook email book and sending copies of itself to everybody in the email book. So um, this is a worm in the sense that it is making copies of itself and propagating itself through a network. Okay, a Trojan horse is a program that either does something other than what it claims to do or possibly does exactly what it claims to do, but also includes a malicious payload on top of it. So uh, just to provide a couple examples, um, we talked previously about how the Dalai Lama got attacked with the ghost um, spyware program by opening a document called Translation of Free Movement for Tibetans in Exile.doc. So, you know, this seems like it was legitimate, but it in fact was not actually uh, that document or potentially was that document, but in addition to the document had a malicious payload attached to the document. Um, similarly, I love you, uh, you know, I guess people were like, hey, somebody loves me. They sent me an attachment. I should open this up and see what it is. Um, yeah, they didn't love you. Sorry. And then uh, there's also been a bunch of fun, quote, fun applications like uh, weather programs, um, which you install the weather program. And, you know, I mentioned this earlier, if you read through the terms of service, it's like, oh, and I'm going to install this nasty thing on your computer. Um, there was another example where there was basically a cartoon character that would um, appear on your desktop and people were like, oh, that sounds like fun. I should go ahead and install this. And it installed that program, but did some other malicious stuff in the background. So these are examples of Trojan horses. They are either things which are completely malicious, uh, like I love you, or they are potentially, they do one thing, but they do some other stuff in the background. So like maybe the weather applications actually do show the weather, but they also install adware that continues to display advertisements even after you stop using the program. Um, or in the case of the buddy program, you know, they show the bear buddy, but in addition to the bear buddy, they install some stuff on your computer. So uh, those are all Trojan horses. Okay, I mentioned zero day exploits before. You may recall um, last lecture when we were talking about Stuxnet, that was the uh, program which was designed to attack the Iranian uh, nuclear uh, centrifuges. Um, and we talked about how there were uh, four different zero day exploits associated with that program. So uh, basically a program which uses a zero day exploit is using weakness that is not known by uh, security researchers. And so the idea here is your computer is not protected against zero day exploits. This is something that nobody knows about except for the person that has a zero day exploit. Um, this is the sorts of things that, you know, nation state security apparatuses like, for example, the NSA are all about, hey, can we find an exploit? And then the question is, are we going to tell Microsoft about this exploit? Or are we going to keep it in our back pocket so we can use it to attack other countries? 
Um, so you can't directly defend against a zero day exploit because you don't know what it is. Uh, and the people that made your software don't know what it is, but uh, you can still practice safe computing. And we'll talk about uh, things that you can do next lecture that will um, hopefully make it harder for somebody with a day zero exploit tool to uh, actually um, get it on your computer and have it run and uh, take advantage of the weakness in your software. Um, on the other hand, uh, kind of the opposite of software which is using a zero day exploit is there are many different attacks that occur that are just variants of pre-existing attacks. So, you know, software that can be used to attack computers is kind of floating around the internet um, and hackers can go ahead and just grab it and, you know, either just use it directly or make a bunch of tweaks to it and use that. And uh, some security experts refer to people that just take these pre-existing programs and use them to attack people as script kitties. So this is sort of a derogatory term that those experts use when referring to these hackers that maybe aren't as sophisticated and can't actually come up with their own uh, ways of attacking computers. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of stuff already out there. Um, now, the thing about the stuff that's already out there is because we do know it's out there. Uh, your operating system manufacturer knows it's out there. Your web browser manufacturers know it's out there. These are not zero day exploits. And so um, when, the, when these sorts of things are discovered, once upon a time, they were zero day exploits. They are now discovered. It's a known thing. They go ahead and patch their software to prevent um, these tools from being able to attack your computer. And so this is why you really need to keep your software updated. 